Thompson. Thank you, Gary. And Jack Hardpence. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. You might not say that by the time the show is over. No, this uh, Libertarian Counterpoint has been running in the greater Sacramento area for 30-something years. Long time. Long 91 time, long or thereabouts. 91? So. Well, that'd be slightly less than 30. It used to be called Libertarian Conspiracy, and I, quite frankly, enjoyed saying I've been on Libertarian Conspiracy more than Counterpoint. So um, what we're going to do is I'm, we're going to talk a little bit about how we came to be in the Liberty Movement, our, our background history, maybe a minute, see if we can keep it uh, around a minute. And then we're going to talk about some topics that are near and dear to us, things that affect us, things that amuse us, things that horrify us. So first of all, my name is again John Cameron. Um, I'm a development officer for an organization called Pacific Legal Foundation. We are, are a nonprofit public interest law firm that defends rights free of charge uh, to all of our clients. And I came to the Liberty Movement early in uh, probably read Ayn Rand when I was about 15 and uh, thought that, you know, this stuff mirrors nature, you know, that in nature the strong survive and the, the smart lead the pack and uh, everything is in balance because of competition. And I thought, well, if, if it works for Mother Nature uh, for billions of years, then it should work for people. Then I, I uh, you know, believe uh, I'm a patriot. I uh, jumped out of airplanes and, and uh, carried a machine gun for a living for a while. And then when, when I got out, I went into commerce and was pretty successful and then started my own business. And, and notice that the thing that galled my clients uh, the most and, and upset me the most was the oppressive, overreaching, crushing government regulation and ignorant or ignoring the Constitution. And um, so that's why, you know, my my libertarian, liberty-based focus is uh, is where it is and why I'm doing what I do for a living now. Now, Lee, why don't you tell us about how you came to the liberty movement? What's a little background, a little history? Um. In retrospect, I think I had this sense of justice and liberty from a very early age. However, I didn't have any formal education in economics, nor much knowledge of, of politics, nor social movements, since I was focused on a professional career for several you're, decades. You're a I'm a recovering anesthesiologist. Re recovering but, anesthesiologist. Uh, but then finally, towards the end of that formal career, I spoke to a um, local assemblyman in Chico, uh, Bernie, the late Bernie Richter, mm -hmm. who sat down two to three hours with me talking about my interests and recommended read a book by Thomas Sowell, who is now my favorite author. Mm -hmm. He says, and then just sort of follow where it takes you from there. And of course, then you read Thomas Sowell and you read uh, uh, Bastiat's The Law mm -hmm. and uh, continues expanding. The more you learn, the more you suffer. Mm. <laughs> and my wife says, oh, you're a real conspiracy theorist. And I thought, well, yes, but there are an awful lot of conspiracies against most of us, aren't there? That's, that's my thinking. So, yeah. And uh, I've been active with the Libertarian Party uh, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. I was secretary of the Sacramento County Party for a number of years mm -hmm. until there was a relatively youthful crew that uh, stepped into elective offices, and I'm happy with that. They're doing fine. Well, cool. There is a future, but uh, we will talk about some rooms for room for opportunity. Room for opportunity for freedom to uh, raise its head. And Jack, you want to give a little, a little Absolutely. Uh, I am Jack Hartpence. Uh, I recently joined the Pacific Legal Foundation. Uh, before that, I was with the Goldwater Institute down in Phoenix, Arizona. Fine organization. Great organization. And I first uh, came to the Liberty Movement, kind of just fell into it at a young age. Um, I was living in New York during September 11th and really had a heightened awareness of you know what it meant to live in this country. And at a young age, kind of really got into government and uh, understanding how important our rights are. Mm. And uh, when an opportunity presented itself to join the Liberty Movement, uh, I took it and uh, I just you know, really do enjoy uh, everything we do mm. that positively impacts citizens. Mm. And that's, uh, we're, we're both fundraisers that uh, we raise money so our pit bull 
brilliant attorneys can defend the Constitution, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. And well, tax citizens who are being abused by the people that should be serving us and not abusing us, right? Well, why don't, and why don't, that, that is a perfect segue into, uh, if, if you had to make this stuff up, if you wrote some of the, the things that we're, we're going to talk about tonight, as fiction and gave them to your editor, they would say, nobody's going to believe that. And one of the things that you're going to talk about, Yem versus City of Seattle, is that correct? Uh, uh, yes, and I, I, I had to take a few notes here. Is that here. Yem the democracy voucher, or did we get that one wrong? Uh, Yim University of Seattle is about uh, private property and landlords being able to choose their tenants. Oh, so we got it. It's a great intro. Them. And I, I took a few notes here and I'll sort of skim over them. Mm -hmm. uh, this couple own and live with their three children in a triplex, three units. Mm -hmm. One is occupied by the family, they rent the other two. Some brilliant maybe brilliant, maybe not so brilliant, uh, individual in Seattle government decided that these, this family might be subconsciously racist. Well, my view is that anybody who's an anti-communist is by definition racist, mm. right? Mm. That's the way it works these days. And uh, so they decided to protect the population or the prospective renters from this potential subconscious racism by this lovely family mm -hmm. by requiring that whoever meets the immediate financial qualification has to have access to that property. These people can't decide whether or not a, a child molester is occupying the backyard with their three children or whether it's somebody that would be a lot more hospitable. Uh, this right's been taken away from them, ostensibly. Uh, that's the sort of thing that Pacific Legal defends people against, that well, sort of that's abuse. That's where we've actually taken that case, amazingly enough. So that little background on the case, um, the idea is that, that um, the hidden racism here is, is, a, is because um, felons are disproportionately black people. Uh, and that is, that is absolutely true. Um, if I think if you're a young black man, if you're between the ages of 18 to 34 and black, you have a one in six chance uh, of going to prison or having been in prison. So um, the, this law protects felons from that um, kind of intrinsic racism by, or that's what it purports to do, by saying that you know, if you're even if you're a felon, you you have uh, the right to to um, uh, rent an apartment, and none of you, the the history of the type of felony that you might have engaged in, like violent behavior, um, you know, child abuse, whatever caused you to be a felon, can be uh, held against you in the rental process. Yet at the same time, uh, if you were to quite legally run uh, a credit report. Uh, on on someone and that came up that you you would be uh, completely okay in denying them a job so that you didn't endanger their coworkers. So um, the city of Seattle in its in its uh, great wisdom has um, decided that uh, a merchant um, can't uh, choose the most qualified applicant uh, with the best possible history to pay their rent on time and keep the place from being destroyed and leave it in a pristine condition when they leave, but has to accept the first person. Yeah, I could the first person that financially, financially uh, can, can pay rent. Claims they yeah. can pay the rent. Yeah. But I, I have a different perspective. The family, by that. The yeah, family is Chong and Marilyn Yim. Yeah. Now it sounds as if they're an Asian family. Now supposing there's, they belong to a church in an Asian community and they want somebody from their church, Buddhist or Confucius or Christian, yeah. wouldn't that be a good thing, the, the togetherness and, and, and family friendly and the like? But no, they can't do that. That's not good enough. The first possible applicant who can meet the minimum financial standards they're required to rent. Is that right? Well, Jack? I think the court, the court of the issue is that it's against the Constitution. It's your right uh, to allow who you want on your private property. And if you don't want someone on your private property, then they shouldn't be on your private property. So uh, 
Wait, what it says si- that in our Constitution? Uh, yeah, it does. Cool. It sounds like a great document. Maybe we should pay more attention yeah. to it, folks. So what the city, out, city of Seattle has done is unconstitutional, which is why PLF is taking the case, because uh, you shouldn't have to give, uh, or rent, rather, your own apartment to the first person that's financially able to pay it. You should be able to select uh, someone that you feel is fit. And on top of that, the YIMS, something that's interesting enough is they have children at their home. Uh, So this is very important to them to make sure that they have people living in their triplex that they want around their children, uh, which I think is a no brainer. They should be allowed to select who they want. (laughs) That was my agreement sneeze there. Sorry about that. No, I absolutely (laughs) agree. Absolutely agree. Um, You know that what, I think, well, um, kind of blessedly or thankfully, whatever term you want to use, I think the city of Seattle has taken over the leadership for crazy from the city of San Francisco. And I think it's, I think it's time somebody did that. And I'm thinking these people are all wet. That's my little Seattle joke there that nobody got. So. Well, they definitely are. But in addition, you should be able to answer this. My, my recollection is that Pacific Legal has a very excellent uh, win-loss record with the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. Do you remember any of those numbers? Uh, well, eight I, out of I, nine I, cases, I, I, or I, nine I, out of ten, nine, or nine? It wasn't. It was nine and zero, oh, but then we lost the last one. Uh, Justice Kennedy. Oh, Tim made, Landa, made, made uh, up some oh, made up some law. Damian Schiff was one of those winners. You've had him on the show. Yes, Tim we Sandifer have. Tim Sandifer, Tim Sandifer, the the, uh, the kilo thing. He, he yeah. lost. That's one of the few losses. Well, years the kilo back. wasn't wasn't us. It was someone else. Yeah. Oh, and, okay. Uh, was was kilo? I, I think it was Tim. No, no, one Tim. Tim yeah, Tim wouldn't lose. Somebody anything. different. He put up or lose. Oh, anything. fair Jack enough. Jack could vouch for you. No, Tim's a good guy. <laughs> I had him on the show numerous times. So um, that's you know. The Constitution of the United States is a very simple document, even with the amendments, and it's the language is is pretty clear, and and activist um, judges have for years, and and uh, cities and counties and states have for years tried to avoid and do end runs around and completely ignore the Constitution, and you know fortunately we work for an organization that uh, doesn't put up with that and uh, we keep them in line. So another example, and I'll take the lead on this one, there's another case we're we're doing. This is the PLF part of the show, Pacific Legal Foundation part. Markle versus U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So there's a uh, dusky gopher frog, and this poor family, uh, this, uh, the Markles, uh, own, I think it's 1,442 acres. Uh, For some reason that number sticks, I could be right or wrong. And the Fish and Wildlife Service has, has declared since this uh, dusky gopher frog is, is threatened uh, or endangered, one of the two. Now legally, they're supposed to treat threatened differently from endangered. So once again, the Fish and Wildlife Service is breaking its own rules by, by treating those two things the same. They've decided that this 1,442 acres is absolutely necessary as critical habitat for this dusky gopher frog. The only problem is that there are no dusky gopher frogs on this critical habitat. There is no way a dusky gopher frog could make its way to this critical habitat. And if this dusky gopher frog managed to hitchhike and got there, he would or she would die because this supposedly critical habitat will not support a dusky gopher frog. So the US but it supports fishing, a lot of bureaucrats, doesn't oh yeah. it? Well, what it, what it supports is the whole idea here. This is the stretch they've managed to make, in complete, um, which is completely at odds with their own rules and regulations. They've made the stretch that, well, if, if someone were to make this habitat suitable for the dusty gopher frog, then it would be critical to this endangered species. And that's so much of a stretch, it's it's kind of insane to think. Yeah, they'd have you to clear the land and replant uh, trees. Clear the land, trees. Repand, yeah. know, irrigate, make it more yeah. of a wetland, and then it would be suitable. Now it is not. So let's, let's do another example. I think we should declare, uh, where's Congress? Where is that located? Um, you mean the, 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 the national cesspool? Actually, the building the where they meet, I, I think we, we should declare, well, it's a swamp, 
And that is suitable habitat. <laughs> Let's put some frogs in habitat. there. And, and the dusky gopher frog could live there quite well That's amongst right. the other amphibians and reptiles. That's right. Amphib well, actually, amphibians would be a step up from the reptiles who seem the to reptiles. reside there now. Uh, I think you're giving reptiles a bad name. But so go ahead. Jack. Well, well one thing I would, I would like to say about the case that uh, pops out to me is the fact that the family uh, has lost $34 million in revenue mm -hmm. due to this and that the government is not going to be repaying them because mm -hmm. they have found that uh, the Endangered Species Act and the frog is more important than the $34 million mm -hmm. that the family has lost, which is just shocking. Well, because think, it's not their money. Why well, should they care? The, the point that it, law in this country generally, and, and our wonderful organization is trying to push this, has stated, uh, and there's some Supreme Court case, the Nolan case, for one, basically said that, that if, uh, and many others after it, said that if, um, if, if one organization or business or person um, does something and, it, and it, uh, it creates a need for government to step in and mandate services or whatever, then that person should pay for it. But if the, the citizens as a whole or a community as a whole decide that um, you know, they need to take a piece of land to turn it into dusky gopher frog critical habitat, then, then the burden of that taking, which is pretty much spelled out in the Constitution, needs to be borne by the citizens who benefit from that decision. So in this case... And of course the uh, burden of proof is everything when it comes to legality. Yeah. So in this case, uh, pretty straightforward if, if you follow the Constitution, that if the people have decided through their surrogate, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, that this habitat is critical to that frog, even though the frog can't live there, then the people should bear the burden of the cost of this and write a $34 million check to the Markles, and that's what we're, we're trying to make happen. So, well done, well done. Now we're going to move on um, and uh, throw it back, throw, shoot it back, to uh, to Lee, our local, police? our local uh, yeah. herpetology study, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the next case. All right, uh, or the, next, the next topic. Oh Do yes, police yes. Use deadly force when non-lethal tactics would be very adequate. For example, when somebody reaches for a pack of cigarettes and they've sh he's shot 33 times, could there be an alternative that would uh, perhaps be less risky to the person who's now dead and perhaps a little more equally risky to, um, um, to the cops. Uh, Lee, what do you think? I welcome the time. There, there are some non-lethal weapons. They're not always effective. And what I think is most tragic is when a family has a, a me family member, some, often a child, living with them who is mentally very unstable. Mm. When that unstable individual gets to the point where they are a threat to themselves and or to others, the police may take custody of the individual, give, force them to have uh, 48 hours of um, mental Psycho, health. Yeah. Exactly, but uh, uh, by the time it gets to that point, the individual is likely very incorrigible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm aware that some uh, jurisdictions are having their law enforcement people get some special training on defusing uh, tense situations and um, I'd love to see, gee, where are the calf ropers when you really need them? Wouldn't, mm. that, wouldn't that solve some of these problems? Well, but, uh, you live in a state where there's some calf ropers. So that, that the, the point when we, when we came up with this topic, um, the, my thought was when I asked this question is that um, is uh, is somebody you know 20 feet away who's reaching uh, for something? Um, is is that an opportunity to, to shoot them because they they may be reaching for a gun? Maybe they're reaching for a ham sandwich. Yep. We and, don't and also, if they're failing to follow directions, well, they may be deaf. There are yeah. instances of that. Or they may have their earphones on, listening to this really loud classical, uh, classical hip, -hop hip hop music, yeah. right? Hip -hop, yeah. And uh, and they can't hear what, what, or, what directions or are given. Like, like most people in this country who are involved in, in crime, they're um, mental, violent crime or, or crimes of resistance. Um, they're mentally ill. Um, they're 
medicated. I think, uh, I think the studies show that like 99% of these so-called mass murderers are on some kind of antipsychotic. Um, so you've got people who are non-responsive. Is being non-responsive to the instructions from a policeman reason enough to fill them full of holes? Yes or no? Well, if they're a threat to the life of the peace officer, then they have to. The the the, 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 the police have to defend mm -hmm. themselves. So but I would like I would love to have a time where, in in a way that it's less likely to be lethal. Mm. So uh, there, what are, let's talk what about some have? alternatives. Then. So Jack, can you think of any alternatives to, for a cop to use when, they're, when they think they might be in danger? They're, they're not certain they're in danger. I could think of a couple. You know, yeah, I, I think that this situation is really a, a tough question because uh, from one perspective, a police officer goes into work every day concerned for his life. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the, on the other hand, it is so incredibly tragic uh, when a police officer, um, you know, has an altercation that is violent with a, a citizen. Mm -hmm. So I think really, you know, it, it is something that, to me, uh, it's just an incredibly difficult situation and it's so situational that it's tough to mm -hmm. uh, put it all in one basket for me personally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, and, and I get that. I'm, I'm going to throw out an idea that there are there's, there's things that, tasers, there's nets. Uh, if anybody watched gladiatorial games, you would see you know, netting people. Some called bear spray that uh, anybody can buy for $29. You know bear spray because you live in bear country. And, uh, and you know I don't really care how tough somebody is. You hit them with something that is designed to make a bear run away in the face, and those things shoot a stream of pepper spray um, accurately 30 feet. Um, that's typically going to stop somebody. You have you have uh, rubber bullets, which you know can break ribs and all the rest of that. But look that's at the veterinarians when they're trying to subdue a, a, a lion or a yeah. Yeah. You got tiger. Yeah, guards. there are you things have, that uh, leave them very limp. Uh, you have retching gas. I mean, you have you have all sorts of alternatives. Um, you know, and yes, on occasion, um, cops will get shot, and I'm not saying that's a good thing. There is some inherent risk to the job, and, and um, I think the numbers, of, the numbers of police that are killed in the line of duty are actually, I think it's maybe by, you know, not our car wrecks or high-speed chases or heart attacks. It's about 300 cops in this country a year. And, um, you know, I'm sorry, but if, if it says that your job is to serve and protect, there is an associated degree of risk with that. And, and I would like to see um, the policemen bear some risk rather than shooting people. Well, and that's my personal opinion. I know that's not right in every actually, situation. I'd like to minimize that risk and, and for a policeman to be carrying a firearm, that is a risk to themselves. I, I worked with a man who, uh, or a young man, a college student, who got a call one Saturday night he had to go home early. His father was a Detroit police officer who made a traffic stop on one of the, uh, the freeway ramps. The perpetrator grabbed a service weapon and bang, gone. Shot him with his own gun. Killed him with That's his own gun. Not so, and I'm nice. not, yeah, I'm not by any means saying that there should be gun control. And, you know, in, in this country, I think uh, uh, more weapons in the hand of citizenry and rather than less is a good thing. So, we, I think we've, Sort of beat this oh. one up. Let's talk. Let's talk about. Uh, um, actually, I'm going to jump around a little bit here. We've got about five or six minutes left. One of the the thing in the in the news that's occupied uh, a lot of press time. There's a there's a uh, blustering leader in North Korea, um, who uh, apparently has the ability to. Uh, to uh, produce nuclear weapons and set them off, and has uh, set off some rockets and they actually sort of go in the direction they're aimed and is threatening all sorts of people all over the planet with uh, nuclear doom if they, if they do anything about his craziness and his oppression and starvation of his very regimented people. So, slave um, state is slave what state, it is. By, by far, some things that happen in North Korea uh, would be war crimes if they were uh, done in Nazi Germany, they were war crimes. So here's my question, and I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it out to both of you and whoever. Is is he a real threat to the world, or or is he one of those folks that that um, simply 
kind of wants to be left alone in his craziness. Um, I think he's undoubtedly a, a real threat. Uh, anytime you have a dictator of a hermit kingdom who's uh, not only running a propaganda machine, but has ICBM capabilities, also is known to have nuclear capabilities, uh, he's known potentially to have a hydrogen bomb as well, uh, and his his goal is to come onto the world stage as a nuclear power to protect his own regime. Mm. I think it goes without question that he is a, a real threat to global peace mm. um, due to the fact that his only chance of survival uh, as a leader is if he comes onto the nuclear stage, which you know you could argue he already has mm. launching uh, ICBMs over Japan. Mm. So and he's, the, he's already slaughtered his uncle, who, who he considered might have been a threat to his power, and just. Didn't he fire an anti-aircraft shell at his uncle and disintegrate him? It's just barbaric, brutal. Well, it's, 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 it's pretty true to form for those folks. So, what, uh, if anything, what what should the United States do? Jack, you seem to have thought this through. Should we should we strike first? Should we be ready to defend? Should we deploy people? I think it, I think it's a very complicated what situation, uh, and I don't feel comfortable to say what we should do just because I'm not uh, knowledgeable enough about the situation. Uh, having said that, I would like to see a diplomatic solution if at all possible, uh, definitely an attempt as a diplomatic solution. Uh, the problem with North Korea in my mind is the fact that Kim Jong-un has such a heavy artillery that could potentially uh, hit Seoul, South Korea. So forget about his nuclear capability, Good but point. if we were to engage in a uh, first response against North Korea, then the problem would be would be that he could hit, say, 30 million people very quickly uh, in Seoul, South Korea, which uh, wouldn't be good for anyone. We don't want to see innocent lives lost. I, I, I agree there. Nor would so, we want to see the innocent slaves who live who comprise the bulk of the population in North Korea slaughtered so quick either. Quick yes or no question, and then we're going to wrap up. The yeah, we got over. Run short. So here's the quick question. Um, um, should we, as the United States of America, do something about it, or is it any of our business? Jack, yes or no? Uh, with North Korea? Yeah. I think in order to ensure yes no? global peace, yes, we need to have some type of solution to the problem on the Korean yes no, Peninsula. Yes or no, Yes or no, Lee? Yes, nonviolent, ideally. Uh, Except right. for one bullet in, in the right place. One bullet in the right brain. All right. <laughs> that wraps it up, folks. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to my guests, uh, Jack Park Pence and Lee Welter. Thank you, It's Dan. been a pleasure um, having you join us this evening for a little bit of Libertarian Thought on Libertarian Counterpoint. We look forward to you watching the show in the future, watching this on YouTube about a week out. And uh, thank you so much again and have a wonderful evening. Thanks for having me.